I'm about to get started for the morning. As I said yesterday, this one, this whole session this morning is really about you using some of the information and the learning and the things that came through yesterday to start making some sense out of this. And again, focusing on that big question of, you know, what would make a good democracy in the UK? And what are the features that are needed to ensure that actually it works well for everybody? So I'm just going to, we're just going to share my screen for a moment. Can I find the right one? And we will get started into things in a moment. Okay, so just a little reminder before we, we get into the discussions, because you'll be spending most of the morning actually in your groups around the conversation guidelines again. And, you know, by and large, we're getting pretty good at this. But as we move forward, we're getting more and more things that actually, you know, people disagree with each other. And, and quite strongly sometimes based on, you know, their own personal worldviews. And, and that's okay. It, what, it's what makes this, you know, this process really exciting. But actually just that little reminder that, you know, we're getting more comfortable with each other, but that's still important about being measured, about how you speak your mind. Speak your mind, but think about how you're speaking your mind. And try not to, you know, offend others within the group. And that comes back to that idea there of respecting each other's opinions. And, you know, respecting each other's opinions also sort of means respecting that the person has the right to have a different opinion. It doesn't necessarily mean that there may be a wrong. And just that one that we highlighted there, we can disagree. It's important we can disagree. But we can disagree with what someone's saying without hopefully attacking the person or their right to be able to say it. So as we get further and further into things that we are going to disagree about, hopefully just try and keep these in mind so that everyone has a good experience here. Okay, but what we are going to really start on is this idea of emerging principles. And we started on this last Sunday morning as well, looking at some of the different principles that you'd started to bring together in week one and two. So you might remember that we looked at the ones here that were around what we, you know, what we expected from the public, but also the relationship between the, the public, the voters, and the people who are there representing them. This morning when we get started, I'm going to ask you to think a bit about the ones that I've just highlighted in pink there. And they are ones that more sort of sit with the system and sit with how, you know, the system and some of the things we're talking about now in terms of accountability and scrutiny and how the system works and what limits there are on governments and parliament. So if we think about these emerging principles, the first one there was limits on the influence of the already powerful. And we talked yesterday a little bit about sort of lobbyists and, and the, the regulations that are in place around sort of lobbying registers, but also media, business, other people that we know are engaging with governments and potentially influencing decisions. And there is a question there that came up uh, in several discussions yesterday about whether courts and regulators could be playing a bigger role in, in this idea of limiting. Very early on, you, you were talking about the principle that no unelected bodies should be making political or policy decisions. And originally, when you were previously considering this, you were very much focusing on you know, the House of Lords initially, but also officials within government, and the people who are advising ministers. But since then, we've also talked about you know, referendums, so actually handing decision-making back to the people. But we also have been talking now about independent judges. So we're, you know, that role to be questioning and or ruling 
on whether laws should be able to stand. So you might want to consider whether this principle is still as you, you know, written or embodies what you are intending. So respect for the results of a vote. And again, originally you were very much talking about that idea of, you know, once a vote's happened, you know, it, it's clear, it's made, it's decided, let's move on. But does it now raise questions for you about whether, you know, if Parliament votes and agrees legislation that impacts on rights and freedoms, is there a role for that to be questioned? Is there a role for judges or the media or the public to, you know, open this up and ask them to reconsider? Well, we've got the rules of law that apply equally. So again, very much initially, it was about sort of, you know, fairness and reducing opportunities to abuse power. But, you know, we were also talking yesterday that, you know, being a politician is a job. And, you know, most of us in our, in our working life have rules and expectations about what we're allowed to do, what we're not allowed to do, and what will happen if, you know, we step over those lines. Do we need to be thinking about what role there is in terms of regulating this further and what is acceptable behaviour? A respect for fundamental human rights of all people was one that you came up with very early on, very much originally when we were talking about it, it was around some equality and the freedom of everyone to actually sort of participate fairly in society and within the democratic process. But again, some of the discussions we've come up with over the last, oh, yesterday really, about do there need to be external arbiters, so judges, et cetera, to ensure that this is upheld? Or is that enough that it forms within the representative system and the role of the public to be holding people to account when things are not seen as fair? And the other one that was on there was the idea of power sharing. And very much the, the idea of power sharing in the context that you were talking about it, was actually about that relationship with, between government and parliament. So that parliament, who's there as a whole, elected to represent all of us, is actually responsible for the decisions that are made being in the best interest of the people. And that idea of working with government and or holding government to account. But, you know, as we were talking about yesterday, we know that government can put forward some decisions without sort of the agreement of all of parliament. And the question is whether, you know, there should be limits on when or in what context that can happen. So, get you back into, back into thinking about some of these big questions about what are the principles, what are the fundamental things and factors and features that help sort of build a good democracy. We're going to pop you in your breakout rooms for a little while to start thinking about some of those principles. That looks like everybody's making their way back from the, the breakout rooms and I think we've got everybody back now which is great. So I know they just had time to look at a couple of the principles that seem sort of most important to consider now. We looked at several of them um, last weekend as well and in the final weekend, we'll be coming back to our whole list and thinking, well, what are the ones that we still think are the particularly important ones to be taking forward? But now, as you know from yesterday, we had two big questions that, that we started the weekend with. And we're now going to move on to really looking a bit more at the first of those questions, which was about how should standards of ethical behaviour be upheld? And you were talking about this uh, yesterday morning and it came through in a lot of the different presentations and the discussions yesterday afternoon as well. And essentially we're looking at that question about, you know, is political accountability enough? So within the system or do we need more? So I'm just gonna share my screen and remind you of something that was touched on yesterday that we're going to use to sort of help focus the discussion here. And it was something that was touched on called the Nolan principles, which essentially these seven principles of, of public life. 
And they're set up to kind of outline those ethical standards that those who are elected to represent us, to represent us are expected to adhere to. So the first one on the list there is this idea of selflessness, that actually people should be acting solely in terms of the public interest. Second one was integrity. So it's saying that people who are elected to represent us must avoid placing themselves under an obligation to people or organizations. So being unduly influenced in their decisions or being obliged to take into account particular perspectives. Obviously integrity is about also not taking decisions that, that benefit immediately themselves, their family or their friends or people they're in relationships with. And that whole idea of declaring any, any interest in the decisions that they're being asked to consider or make on behalf of people they represent. Objectivity was the third one on the list. And that's about you know, taking decisions impartially, fairly on merit, using the evidence that is there to inform a decision, considering it and without having a sort of biased position. So that impartiality is really important in decision-making. That didn't quite work. Something on the bottom that maybe shouldn't be there right now. The fourth one was accountability. So actually we've talked a lot about accountability and that actually the people who are elected to represent us need to be accountable to the public and the people who voted for them for their decisions and actually open to scrutiny, able to be questioned about why they've made certain decisions or actions that they've taken. The fifth one there was, is openness. And again, it links to those ideas of taking decisions in an open and transparent manner. So again, being able to you know, be clear, that the public can be clear about how decisions have been made and why. And it also links the idea that within across the political system that actually the information should not be withheld from the public unless there are, you know, in certain occasions, there are sort of clear and lawful reasons for doing so, at least for some periods of time. Six, honesty, one that I know has come up in a lot of your discussions, and fundamentally that idea that people need to be behaving truthfully. And seven. Leadership. And this one was highlighted in the presentation yesterday, that actually it's not just about living up to all these principles, but actually demonstrating them and treating others with respect and calling out when actually some of these principles or poor behaviour is taking place. So that is the sort of seven Nolan principles. And what we're going to ask you when you go into your breakout rooms is thinking about those principles, but also some of the things you potentially discussed um, on Saturday morning. In a good democracy, what would you expect to see from members of parliament? And also see from the whole representative system to demonstrate that these principles are actually being upheld. And just before you go into the groups, I'm just going to remind you that when we're talking about the representative system, we're not just talking about government, we're just talking about parliament, but that much wider system that starts with people who elect people to parliament to represent us, and that, the people, and that those parliamentarians, the ones who have a majority or form a coalition, form the government that then go on to act and lead the decisions. So it's a whole system when we're talking about what would you expect to see in practice, to know that these types of principles were being upheld. And on that basis, I'm going to stop and let you get into considering it. Over to you, Charlotte. Okay, so it looks like most of you are making your way back. Um, Hopefully that last discussion was, was fruitful and I was popping in and out of some of the jam boards and having a look at what was, was popping up there. So lots of, lots of ideas from people really starting to look at that first question that we set for the weekend about 
how should standards of ethical behavior be upheld within government and parliament and our various elected officials. So, been a key topics of conversation, but this afternoon, or oh, not quite this afternoon, but the last thing we're going to be doing as we move into the afternoon is focusing now a bit on that's the second big question that we were looking at, which is around the limits on governments and parliaments. So you may remember, let me just find my thing. So the, the real second question that we're, that we're looking at here and going to be focusing on for the rest of the session is to what extent should government and parliament be subject to legal limits? That was the big question we set for the weekend. But we're just, we're going to focus in, we're going to focus in really on, on, you know, what that means, what that right. might mean in terms of what we expect. So you might remember in weekend two, we talked quite a lot about whether there should be limits on what a democratically elected parliament and government should be able to do. And there was general agreement across most of the groups that there, that there did need to be limits in place, particularly to protect basic rights of, of people and the population, and that there were basic features of the democratic system that it should be difficult for government or parliament to change without a lot of scrutiny. You were also talking about, you know, there being a big role for the public in actually playing that role of scrutiny as well, that role of holding governments to account. And there was also a lot of emphasis in the third weekend when we met about the role of Parliament more broadly being there to keep an eye and scrutinise government and government decisions. So before we go into this next discussion, I'm just going to give you a bit of a, a frame and a reminder of some of the things that you've already been talking about. So hopefully you can see the screen now. So the question there, the big question that we set was what extent should government and parliament be subject to legal limits? And really what, we're going, what we've been talking about, thinking about across this weekend is like who should enforce any of the limits that may be desired or wanted to happen? So yesterday afternoon after lunch, you were having a bit of a conversation in your groups about what were the key risks and the key benefits of governments and parliament being subject to legal limits. And some of the risks that you identified when we were looking at the jam boards last night was this idea of there being, you know, there's a risk of potentially too much interference in government's programs. So what the government's been elected to deliver on. The idea that too much interference or too much um, scrutiny too much involvement of, of, sort of, be, of, of regulators or judges, not being able to get things done, slowing down the process. And the idea that if people have been elected, then there was this idea of a right to rule. There were also some concerns raised about a lack of diversity in who actually would be doing the overseeing. And that came up through some of the discussions around the makeup of the current judiciary, who are the judges? Do they reflect society as a whole? and therefore the values of society. There were also concerns about, you know, while it's not quite legal limits, the idea that, you know, there's not enough regulators and even sometimes the judicial roles don't have enough teeth to be enforceable. And whether actually that created a waste of resources where a lot of bodies set up overseeing, scrutinizing, looking at different questions, but actually it was not a good use of resources, it was a risk that some groups considered. Some groups also highlighted that the, you know, the system as it was described to you yesterday felt a bit disjointed and it had been an evolving and, you know, an evolving and reactionary system in some ways, rather than actually a planned system that set out, you know, these are the things that, that courts can actually get involved in and intervene. And for some, this idea that actually, you know, if there were going to be judges involved, that actually these people were less accountable than the people that we've elected to parliament because overall they are accountable to the voters and to the electorate. But at the same point, there were also benefits being seen. And the fundamental benefit that people kept coming back to was it protects the public from harms. 
protects basic human rights, protects we as a country from having, you know, arbitrary rules made that actually potentially could harm sections of society. There was an idea that actually the sub being subject to legal limits actually would make government think twice about some of the more controversial decisions and have to actually really think whether they were in the public's best interest. There was the idea that actually the, the, that there being legal recourse actually would in, its sense, in itself incentivize parliament and government to better regulate themselves when they're making decisions. And something was raised in a number of groups about there giving a clear sort of separation of powers and so preventing misuse of authority of governments. And fundamentally, the idea of, you know, overall, the increased transparency that, you know, if, if decisions are challenged by the courts or investigated, that actually there is a clarity about how and why decisions have been made. So before we go into the question, I'm just going to hand over to Alan for a moment to just sort of give you a reminder of some of the other things we we're talking about. Uh, thanks very much, Kayla. So yeah, so we're going to be focusing in this session particularly on this question here, to protect democracy and basic rights, should there be limits on the laws that Parliament can pass? So yesterday we were talking about various kinds of legal limits on government and Parliament, and this time we're just focusing in on this question just so that we can really get to grips with it fully. Uh, so to protect democracy and basic rights, should there be limits on the laws that government can pass? And I guess, as Kayla was suggesting there, um, we might think that there are various features of democracy that, that are important uh, and that we need to ensure are not undermined in any way. So that we have free and fair elections, for example, that parliament is able properly to scrutinize the proposals that are made by government. We might think these are basic principles in our democracy that um, we need to protect, we need to ensure uh, are, are kept there. And similarly with basic rights, we might think um, the right to life or the right not to be discriminated against or the right to vote, uh, that these kinds of basic rights are things that we should protect uh, in our overall democratic system. Um, so what this slide, show, this slide shows is the kind of spectrum of different views as to how best we can protect these kinds of basic features of democracy and basic rights. So on the left hand side of the scale is the idea that we should protect uh, these features of democracy and basic rights simply through the political process, through political mechanisms of representation and accountability, um, that um, the system through which we, we choose our representatives and hopefully we can choose representatives who are going to uphold democracy and basic rights and we hold them to account for what they have done, that that's the best way of upholding these principles and that we shouldn't have the courts getting involved in, in, in these decisions. So that's one end of the spectrum. And that's how the UK used to be. This is, the, the UK used to be like this uh, up to kind of the late 1990s. That's how the system worked. <clears throat> then at the opposite end of the scale, at the right hand side of the slide there, um, there's the, uh, an alternative system in which there are actually hard legal limits uh, on what parliament can do. And Chris yesterday uh, at the end of the morning, he talked about how the United States is an example of a system where uh, Congress as it's called there, the equivalent of parliament is subject to hard legal limits because there's a, a full written constitution in the United States that sets out various rules. And if the Supreme Court in the United States determines that uh, Congress has passed a law that violates those basic rules, then it strikes down that law. It says that actually that is not law, it no longer exists. And we don't have that uh, system in the UK. Um, but one view might be that, 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 that that's a system that really ensures ensures that the, the um, politicians in parliament and government cannot breach these fundamental features of democracy and fundamental rights. And then between these two uh, kind of ends of the spectrum, uh, you can imagine lots of different kind of variations within that space between those ends of the spectrum. So what we've got on the picture there in the middle is soft legal limits. And that's actually what we now have in the UK, at least for some matters. <clears throat> 
So as we mentioned yesterday, Parliament in 1998 passed something called the Human Rights Act, a piece of legislation, a piece of law called the Human Rights Act. And in that, Parliament set down a list of basic rights that it said it regards as being particularly important. And these are rights to do with the sorts of things that I just mentioned, right to life, right to vote, right to uh, free speech, and all sorts of different things. Um, and so now under the Human Rights Act, if I or any of you or anyone else think that our rights have been violated by, by a law that par Parliament passes, um, then we can take that matter to court and we can get the courts to rule on whether our rights have been violated by this law or not. Um, but this is a soft legal limit rather than the hard li limits that exist in a place like the United States. Because if the court says that um, a law uh, goes against, is incompatible with our basic rights, uh, then that law still stands. It's not like the law stops being a law, um, but the matter goes back to parliament. And the courts are asking Parliament to think again, to think twice. Do you really want to pass this law that goes against the basic rights that Parliament has already said uh, are really important? So in that case, you know, it goes back to Parliament. So you have a kind of mixing of the political processes of upholding the principles and the more legal processes of upholding the principles. So the question that we're getting you to think about a bit further now is, do we want to be at the left hand of that spectrum where it's um, the political processes alone are protecting those principles? Do we want to be at the right end of the spectrum where there's a very strong role for the courts? Or do we want to be somewhere in between where it's a bit of both? It's a bit of kind of give and take between parliament and the courts uh, in order to uphold these rights. Back to you, Kayla. So yeah. This is really the question where we're asking you to go into the groups and think about. Protect democracy and basic rights. Should there be limits on the laws that Parliament can pass? And again, really encourage you to think about it as being along a spectrum, that it's not necessarily you know, a choice between these different things, but also in what, in what situations does it become important that there should be maybe more limits and in what situations not. Now, each group is being asked to start off with focusing on either the sort of basic rights or those basic features and principles of democracy. Your facilitators will let you know which one you're getting started on. And we will see you just before 12.30. Yeah, this looks like everybody's heading back in now. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you all very much for, for all of the, the work you've been doing this morning. This is the end of weekend five. And this is really, we're getting to the kind of crunch point now. Because when we come together in weekend six, it's not about new evidence. It's not about new speakers or new information. It's about you all being able to go back over and think about and reflect on all the things that you've considered and some of the sort of provisional conclusions that you'd started to make at the end of each weekend to go, well, what do we want to actually say as an assembly about what a good democracy should look like? To help us do that, because you'll know there's been a lot of things done, you know, on the, on the jam boards and the notes taken by facilitators that have started to develop up some provisional statements and conclusions around when, for example, referenda are a good idea or the balance of power between parliament and, and government in different sorts of circumstances, who should be able to do, you know, have the power to, for example, to decide where parliament sits. Lots of different things that we've been considering right across. In order to prepare for weekend six, we've been pulling a lot of this together in the background. And we'll be pulling together again the work that you've done today. So that means that on Wednesday this week, you will get an email from us, which will have a survey in it. The survey is asking you to start to review the work that's come out of all the different groups. And it, that, it's not everything, but we're pulling this together into a bit of a package of things that you started to conclude so that you can prioritize what are the things that collectively, as an assembly, you want to be focusing on in weekend six 
to be able to then draw some solid recommendations that you've had time to consider, review, reflect on, add a bit of detail to, and make sure that collectively they're the messages you want to send about what a good democracy should be like. So when you get the email on Wednesday, please do have a look at it. We'll leave it to we'll leave it with you like through to after the weekend, because it may take you a little time just to have sort of read through the information, think about the things that seem most important to you, but very much ask you all to take part in that so that when we come to weekend five, we've uh, weekend six, we've got a clear signal from you all about the things that are important to focus on. So that's my that's my practical thing. That's how we're getting there. And then weekend six, you will be working with each other. Alan and Meg will be around to sort of give information, like bits of information, clarification, help sort of make sure that, you know, nothing's been misunderstood somewhere along the line, but actually not about speakers, not about new learning, but about you guys taking control of what, you, what you're putting out at the end. So I think it's going to be really exciting. So that's that's really the things I need to say. Alan, do you want to say anything before we finish up? Uh, just a couple of things from me, uh, and I'm also loving watching dog, uh, John's dog go crazy, by the way. This is, this is a fantastic viewing for anyone who's got John on their screen. Uh, but just a couple of things from me. So the first thing is we have the research survey that you do at the end of each weekend. Uh, so hopefully that's just been arriving in your email inbox over the last um, couple of minutes. So please, please, please do fill in that survey. We really uh, value the uh, feedback that you give us and the further thoughts that you give us in that survey and it helps us understand how the citizens assembly is working um, and uh, how it, citizens assemblies in general might play a part in democracy in the future and remember we will again have um, the uh, the hat with numbers and uh, someone who fills in the survey will get that extra bonus 100 pounds at the next weekend um, and yeah, finally, from me, just thank you. Thank you for working so hard again over the course of this weekend. I know it's been another weekend when we've been working you very hard. We've been straining everyone's brains with all sorts of complex stuff about the innards of how our democracy works. Um, so I'm really excited to see now pulling all of this together over the next couple of weekend, weeks and culminating, ending in the weekend, our final weekend together in a couple of weeks time. So as Kayla says, we're moving into the, the really exciting bit of this process now, and it's going to be fantastic to be doing that with all of you. So thank you very much. And that's that. Enjoy your afternoons and we'll see you in a couple of weeks time.